when I met Richard and Debbie in 2018, it was natural for me to be interested in the Eyes of Midnight. So I, I read the Eyes of Midnight, and I had, I had some unanswered questions. There, there, to, to me, there were some loose ends in the White Cap story. Uh, so I, re I read the Eyes of Midnight, I read the Crozier book, and I read Kaz Walker's book, and I had unanswered questions. The one thing that I never was able to unravel uh, after having read those three publications was the, the narrative, the narrative that had the original narrative. And that was, it goes something like this, as I understand it, that a group of prostitutes around 1892 moved into Copeland Creek up above Gallenberg, between uh, Gallenberg and Cosby. A judge, th this is a picture of what is believed to be the, the uh, house of ill repute. This is on Copeland Creek, right off of Highway, I guess, 73, going to Cosby. And it's still there. We, Richard, Debbie, and I went last May, and we took pictures of that location. So the narrative went on like this, that a group of prostitutes moved into Copeland Creek in 1892. A judge complained that he couldn't get convictions against the prostitutes. So either in open court or at a cafe in Sevierville, he basically suggested that the good folks uh, take matters into their own hands. Now that was, to me, that was a lot to have happen in a very short amount of time. So I started looking at, I, I, I subscribed to newspapers.com, which ended up being a terrific resource for us. This is the very first newspaper article that I was able to find that references white capping in Sevier County. This is from January 27th, 1892. So right away, I, I realized that my questions about the timeline were accurate because the prostitutes could not have moved into Emmerich's Cove, Copeland Creek in 1892, and a judge complained that he couldn't get convictions when they're mentioned in a January 1892 newspaper article. So I immediately knew that something uh, something went right. There was more information to the story that I had, had not been able to locate. There was a resource that we found that we mentioned in at the dead hours of midnight. In 1988, a master's thesis was written by a man named William Joseph Cummings III and it was a wealth of information and that and in, in his newspaper in his thesis in his master's thesis he references the fact that judge that there was some that it was believed that the judge who had made those remarks either in open court or in the cafe in Sevierville was Judge Hicks now, if you've read all, if some, most of you read one, one or more of the stories. This newspaper article from, article from 28 March and 29 March, 1897, has Sheriff Tom Davis, or Deputy Sheriff Tom Davis, uh, in print, complaining that he believed Judge Hicks was the person who made the comment. He says that Judge Hicks has many friends among the white caps and furthermore that the white caps were the outcome of a remark made by Judge Hicks. So all those other publications mention a an unnamed judge but here we have a newspaper article five years after the, the, the beginning of the organization that names Judge Hicks and in the next day's newspaper article they gave Judge Hicks an opportunity to counter that claim.
The interesting thing about this is that both newspaper articles say that that encounter in the courtroom happened about seven years earlier. That makes it 1891 or 1890, right? So that moved the timeline even, even further back. So now we're somewhere around 1890, 1891, which gives all the other events time to take place. Circuit Court met in Sevier County in March, July, and September. If the judge complained that he couldn't get convictions, that gave him several sessions, which he said he had not been able to get convictions. So that's the uh, that's more proof, we believe, that it all started a little bit earlier than had been re previously reported. Uh, now, newspaper articles in and of themselves can have questionable uh, stories in them. But you can't refute the date, and that's the important part to us for this story, is that no matter what the article itself says, it references specific dates. And that changes, that, that more firmly puts the uh, timeline in proper perspective. I mentioned the, news, the uh, master's thesis by William Joseph Cummings. So if you're taking notes, or I think we're being recorded, you can look this up on the internet. You can look at this master's thesis by William Joseph Cummings III, published in June 1988. So it's been around a while. In that news, in, in his thesis, very early on, he references another newspaper article that even more firmly establishes uh, some of the timeline. This is a May 1892 article in the Knoxville Tribune. It says the White Cat movement originated in Emmer's Cove two or three months ago and was headed by two men and a number of married women who sought to take revenge upon men who had proved false to their marriage vows. Nowhere else had I ever read that women were involved in white capping. Everything else I read prior to this newspaper article suggested that Dr. Henderson had been the founder of the Bluebills. In May 1893, a woman named Mary Breeden and her, two of her daughters were whipped. Mary Breeden died in August of 1893 as a result of the wounds inflicted upon her by the Whitecaps. Dr. Henderson went to her aid in August 1893, shortly before she died. And the, the story that I, the narrative that I had encountered prior to this newspaper article suggested that at because Dr. Henderson was outraged at the brutality that caused Mary Breeden's death, he started the Blue Bills. But he could not have started the Blue Bills in August 1893 if they're mentioned in a newspaper article in May 1892. Now, one of the other big questions I had about the whole white cap saga was, you know, it, every number, everything I've read suggested there were between 650 and 1500 white caps. So if it originated in Emmerich's Cove in 1892 and effectively ended when uh, Catla Tipton and Plez Wynn killed the Whaley's in December 1896, that's about five full years. But that's a fairly efficient uh, growth for an organization in a county that had 20,000 people and 4,000 voting males in, in, that, in that decade of the 1890s. So one of the questions I had was how were they able to uh, 
grow that much that quickly in such a rural population, mountainous population. The last bullet comment on this newspaper article gives a hint where it says it's whispered that the leader of the gang is a justice of the peace. Now that, that's a big deal. In the Master's Thesis by William Joseph Cummings, I, I pulled out some quotes of his that may explain why the white caps, what I call, or in our book, metastasized in Sevier County, because they effectively spread throughout all the, the civil districts in Sevier County. Cummings said that shortly after the Sharvari of the prostitutes in Emmerich's Cove, which was uh, whip, whipping them out, uh, they thought that the, the, the immorality, they could uphold the Victorian morals of the time uh, if they just took a bundle of switches to the women and threatened them with the, whip, with the whipping. They threatened them, the prostitutes didn't leave, so they went back and whipped the prostitutes and they left. So that's what that means. But where this, take, where this whole saga takes an interesting turn is it says that white cap gangs were organized by justices of the peace. Now the, now the, the image, the whole picture of, of how white capping spread throughout Sevier County, I think starts becoming a little clearer goes on to say that within, within a short time, white cap gangs were being sponsored by wealthy farmers. So on the one hand, you have white cap gangs being organized by justices of the peace. And on the other hand, you have them being sponsored by wealthy farmers who helped the vigilantes by guaranteeing their bail and providing counsel during court proceedings. What Richard and I came to believe was that the white capping that spread, uh, the nature of white capping changed very, very early on. From the upholding of Victorian morals to uh, a means and method, method for landowners to deal with unruly tenants. And there's even some evidence that uh, some white capping took place that made people leave their farms in Sevier County. I, I reference in the book that I know a Methodist preacher whose grandfather came to Blount County from Sevier County in the early 1900s, and he's from one of those prominent families whose name uh, is associated with white capping, but his grandfather said he couldn't get property in Sevier County. So that led me to believe that maybe this man's grandfather was on the wrong side of white capping, or on the right side of justice. Now what's the significance of the justices of the peace? And you've probably heard, if you've read any of these other publications, that uh, white caps managed to infiltrate grand juries. And has anyone heard that? That they couldn't get convictions because they would plant white caps on grand juries. Well, I didn't understand how they were able to do that until I read this, this uh, master's thesis and it really explained to me in more detail what actually happened. In Sevier County, justices of the peace represented civil districts in the county court. So the county court was made up by justices of the peace two justices from each civil district, and then three from the county seat, which would have been Sevierville. That was your county court. It says that in Sevier County, a grand jury of 13 men, usually impaneled by the county court, listened to testimony to determine if evidence existed. There's your mechanism. If justices of the peace made up the county court and the county court impaneled grand juries, 
That's how they got white caps on grand juries. Now, one other question that Richard and I had about the origins of white caps and blue bills in Sevier County, after we saw the newspaper article from May 1892 that it mentioned the existence of a group called Blue Bills, was the role of John Sam Springs in Emmerich's Cove. He was the postmaster there, and he's the one from that we borrowed the title for the book. Uh, he said, any man or set of men who would go at the dead hours of midnight under the cover of darkness, mass themselves, and drag poor defenseless women from into the night and beat them as a base coward and not worthy of citizenship. So we felt like John Sam Springs played a, a, a key role in the eradication of white capping, in particular in Severe County in uh, Emmerich's Cove. There's no evidence. There's a there, the, there's one killing in, in April 1892. I believe it was. Bruce Llewellyn, or it was either Llewellyn or Williamson, was killed in Emmerich's Cove in April 1892. After that, there are no incidents reported of white capping in Emmerich's Cove. So we feel very strongly that not only did he run them off, he kept them out. The only, it, it, I think in the, the blurb from the Smoky Mountain Historical Society, it said we were gonna tell some of the wild stories now, the, the one wild story that we found that I had not read anywhere else was, it, was an event that took place in September 1894. Uh, Congressman Houck had made a speech at Jones Cove and had denounced Whitecapping. The next day, he traveled through Emmerich's Cove to a Baptist church in Gatlinburg where he was confronted by Whitecaps. But he, all, he, but he passed through Emmerich's Cove unharmed. And un, he was not harassed in Emmerich's Cove. So we feel like John Sam Springs, you know, in the book we say he essentially bookends the Whitecaps saga because he ran him out of Emmerich's Cove in 1892 he was on the he was the foreman of the grand jury who returned a true bill against Bob Catlett in 1897 uh, that if that's or 1896 that that started the whole sequence of events where uh, Plez Wynn and Catlett Tipton were paid to kill the Whaleys. Do y'all know where this these markers are in Emmerich's Cove? This is uh, a guy named Dr. Vince Engel, he's a dentist in uh, Meredith. He owns the John Sam Springs Place. Now, Richard, you may have to help me out. Uh, it's on Emmerich's Cove Road, off of uh, yeah, Highway right across the bridge. Off right of Highway 72. Covered bridge? Yeah. No, no. The next bridge down. And, and you turn, and his farm and house is right there on the right. So. Vince Engel still lives, he, he lives at the John Sam Springs Homestead, and he's, he put these markers up. One uh, talks about his contribution to the eradication of white caps in Sevier County. The other one marks the general vicinity where he's buried. Now, during our research, we, we used uh, resources all over. East Tennessee Historical Society, the Hodges uh, Library, the Special Collections Department, the uh, Tennessee Library, State Library and Archives. I already told you about newspapers.com. But we discovered in the Peter Prince Collection and the Special Collections Department at UT Library, we, what we believe is an ever before published picture of Laura Whaley. Laura McMahon Whaley. Now, this sketch, the sketch here that is in Cass Walker's book, and I believe it may be in the Crozier book as well, 
it's obvious that whoever sketched that sketch used that photograph to sketch his sketching. So that, that was a fantastic uh, find for us. And we also, you know who Laura Whaley was? Yes. Yeah, okay. Laura, Laura and Bill Whaley were the young couple, and I say young, they were in their late teens, who had got sideways with Bob Catlett, who was a, a wealthy uh, landowner uh, from a prominent family in Sevier County. And, and he used those white capping methods to deal with the, the, the Whaley, or with a guy named uh, Maples, Walter Maples. Bob Catlett had promised Laura Whaley and her husband Bill that they could move in to a cabin. And when they went to move in, Walter Maples and his family were living there. So Catlett went back to Laura Whaley and had her write a white cap note to Walter Maples telling him if you don't leave the white caps are going to be paying a visit well they took the note tacked it on the on the door and rocked through rocks at the house the cabin and shotgun the cabin that was how Tom Davis was able to bring Bob Catlett before a grand jury, which normally that would have been a, a petty crime, a misdemeanor. So Bob Catlett, the wealthy, prominent landowner in Sevier County, was really incensed that how dare he be dragged into before a grand jury. So they, passed, they found a true bill, the grand jury found a true bill against Bob Catlett and before it went to trial, he paid Catlett Tipton and Plez Wynn $50 to kill Laura Whaley and her husband Bill Whaley. That, that's, and that's what effectively ended, most people believe, ended the White Cap saga in Sevier County. I don't know if it did or not. Um, our first chapter in our book, we we say uh, two bad men are hanged, but were they scapegoats? You have to figure that if, if between 650 and 1500 white caps were conducting up to a dozen raids a night and only two people paid the price, then somewhere between 648 and 1498 people breathed a sigh of relief, right? Because these two paid the ultimate price. Now, when Plez Wynn and Catlett Tipton kicked in the door to kill Bill and Laura Whaley, her sister was in the room with them. And once again, this is a never before, that we believe, a never before published uh, photograph from the Peter H. Prince collection at UT Special Collections in the Hodges Library. So, Catlett, uh, Bob Cat, or, uh, Catlett Tipton and Plez Wynn break in the door they have masks on that cover their faces. They don't say a word, but they know, that Laura Whaley knows why they've come. They've come to kill her. She had a, an infant daughter who'd been born in September, three months prior. She asked the killers if she could hand her infant daughter to her sister who was in a bed in the same room. They allowed her to do that and then shot both of them in the head with a shotgun. Very brutal uh, murder. But what had happened was, even though Plez Wynn had a white cap cover over his face, it's believed that he dropped something on the ground and when he leaned over to pick it up, his mask separated from his face and Lizzie Chandler was able to identify him as one of the two who had come, broken in. So those are really the, 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 the new additions to, uh, to uh, the Eyes of Midnight. One other, this is, a, this is really an iconic uh, photograph. This is Plez Wynn um, in the river getting baptized at some point before he was hanged. Now, I've read and heard that 
They didn't know who the minister was, who Plez went, and, and the water. But it had been that I, what I've read prior to our research was that uh, Sheriff Tom Davis was in the water with them on the left there. But I included a picture of Miller Fillmore Maples, who was actually the sheriff of Sevier County just before Tom Davis became sheriff. And that's a great likeness, if you ask me. The picture on the left looks an awful lot like the man in the water with uh, Plez Wynn and the minister. And this is the picture of Tom Davis, the sheriff. Who, the, he was the deputy sheriff who became uh, the sheriff in Sevier County. One last resource that uh, provided a lot of information was a June, I believe, 2nd, 1929 newspaper article from the Knoxville News Sentinel. And it goes into a lot of detail about the White Cap saga, really 30 years after the fact. It, this, was, this would have been 30, Plez Wynn and Catlett Tipton were killed or hanged, executed on July 5th, 1899. So this is like the 30th anniversary of their execution. So really that, that's all that we've added to the story and I hope you have questions.